gonna in a second okay very good i think now we are set to go let's Hopefully. all cross our fingers that electricity doesn't play other other jokes <laughs> francesco go ahead okay i'm back i apologize for the delay but it's only a 50 minutes delay so hopefully it will not mess up the schedule too much i was uh, giving my lecture from my office because i thought the internet connection was more reliable but then there was a huge uh, end of the electric power and so all the physics department now is without electric power and uh, luckily i don't live too far away so i just run back to my house but it's really hot so it was really a difficult run anyway i hope things will go smoothly from now on so as i was saying uh, i thank again everybody for inviting me and i'm really happy to tell you about dark matter and uh, before the interruption i was saying that when you talk about dark matter there are uh, different perspectives you can take and so i would like to do uh, I mean, I will discuss the uh, several aspects of dark matter. I will discuss today how we got convinced that dark matter exists. I will discuss theoretical framework. Uh, I will discuss uh, experimental ideas to test these frameworks. So I will try to do a broad view. But of course, my point of view is affected from uh, uh, the kind of research I do, the kind of way I approach it to the problem for, for the first time. and. Uh, I have the perspective of a physicist of uh, fundamental interactions. So the reason why I care about uh, dark matter is because uh, I want to answer a very simple question, apparently. And the question is, uh, what are the building blocks of our universe? So this is something that we always wanted to understand, uh, and we, I mean, uh, uh, humans, I'm for sure not the first one asking this question. Uh, we have evidence that already several centuries before Christ, uh, Greek philosophers were asking the same question. And uh, perhaps the most famous one was uh, Democritus, that was the first one to uh, talk about atoms. However, the approach that was around at the time uh, was uh, quite different from the way we do science today. And the reason is that none of these philosophers even care about uh, making sure that they were right, that <clears throat> in some sense, they did not look for an experimental validation. And it took 2000 years, and here I put a timeline of this uh, very slow progress in our uh, attempt to answer the question. It took 2000 years until, uh, thanks to Galileo Galilei, we learn uh, the scientific method and we learn uh, how we do modern science uh, today. From Galileo uh, until the actual experimental evidence for atoms, it took two more centuries. And then we learn one century afterwards, uh, in 1897, that the atoms actually have an internal structure, despite their name, because atom in uh, ancient Greek means uh, something you cannot split, you cannot divide. And then progress uh, started to become uh, quite fast, actually, in the last century, because not only we learned that the atom had a structure, but we also learned that it was mostly empty with a very small nucleus at the center and uh, electrons orbiting around. And then we started to explore the subnuclear, subnuclear structures. We discovered a lot of elementary particles, and then we found a unified description known as the standard model. And uh, you had in the first week uh, uh, lectures on the standard model by Professor Romanino. So I'm assuming that at least you had the first uh, exposure to the standard model of particle physics. And uh, you see, we came to the last uh, discovery of standard model particles only eight years ago. Uh, the anniversary of eight exact years will be in, four, in a few days on the 4th of July. And so you see that in some sense, we are lucky to uh, live around these days because uh, we came to the answer to a question that uh, was uh, around already several centuries before Christ. 
So it is a privilege in some sense to be alive and to do physics in an age where we can find answers to these questions. And uh, what uh, the standard model taught us is uh, a magnificent unified description because we learned that uh, all the uh, visible universe, so from the atomic nuclei to the atoms, to the molecules, to the scale of humans, and I choose Pelé for this special occasion, I usually use somebody else. And then uh, the, the planets, the solar system, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, all the visible universe with the length scale spanning many, many orders of magnitude is all made of the same building blocks, okay? And these building blocks are the particles of the standard model, the ones that you discussed in the first week in the standard model lectures. And uh, I'm sure you have also seen that there is a very compact way to uh, not only list these particles, it's a list of not many particles. There are quark, leptons, uh, forces mediator, and uh, the Higgs boson. But also we have a very uh, unified understanding and also quite elegant. And the equation describing the fundamental laws of, use of uh, nature can uh, just fit uh, a t-shirt, as uh, I'm sure you have seen if you have been to some physics centers, this is usually what you find in gift shops. Okay, so our understanding of the uh, visible universe is uh, quite fantastic. We know what it is made of. We also know the principles governing the interactions among these uh, fundamental degrees of freedom. Of course, uh, even within the standard model, there are open problems. For example, uh, the size of the baryon asymmetry, okay? I'm sure you have seen that our universe is not symmetric between matter and antimatter. So this is something that belongs to the standard model sector. And uh, we still don't know what mechanism was responsible for creating this asymmetry. And there are other open issues in the standard model. So I don't want to claim that uh, the standard model is something that uh, uh, doesn't require any further study, okay? But at least uh, for the visible universe, and I'm emphasizing visible for a reason that will be clear, hopefully in a few slides, our visible universe is made of something that we know and we also know how these uh, fundamental particles interact among themselves. So can we at least uh, declare that uh, we found an answer to the question asked by Democritus? So we have a list of these fundamental particles and we also understand uh, how they interact. Can we declare victory and the game is over and so if you had a time machine, maybe you can go back in time and tell the mockers, look, this, this is the answer that you were looking for. So the answer is no. The answer is no, and this is uh, the reason, it's part of the reason why I'm here at this school to tell you part of the problem, part of the reasons why this answer is no. And uh, this uh, nice uh, cosmic pie, uh, which is uh, describing the current energy budget of the universe, shows us that approximately 5% of the uh, energy content of the universe today is described by standard model matter. So it's described by particles that we know and we understand. The remaining 95% is a split between dark matter and dark energy. And uh, this is something that uh, we do not know the composition. We do not know the origin. We do not know how in the early universe these particles were produced until they form the cosmological structures we observe today, okay? So we understand only a minimal part of our universe, only approximately 5%. And I emphasize even within this 5%, there are open questions such as the baryon asymmetry and uh, several others. So in these uh, five lectures, my job is to focus on this 26.8%. Uh, uh, so it's more or less one quarter of the energy budget. And we will deal with dark matter. And uh, as I mentioned already at the beginning, uh, mostly in this lecture, we will review the evidence. We will review the reasons why we got convinced that dark matter actually exists. And then uh, we will also uh, discuss uh, uh, theoretical frameworks that try to provide a microscopic origin for the dark matter particle. And we will also discuss searches to find uh, these particles today 
and uh, learn about their properties. So the main subject of this lecture is uh, to explain to you how we look at the invisible, which is a question that uh, I also asked myself the first time I approached this, uh, this topic. And it's a question that many people uh, ask me usually. So dark matter is something that we uh, know it behaves like uh, any other particle we know in the sense that it carries gravitational interaction. So it interacts with visible particles like protons, electrons, and uh, all the particles of the standard model. Dark matter interacts with them through the gravitational force, okay? But that's the only thing we know so far. And in particular, dark matter does not emit light. So if you think about uh, the way we learn about our universe since uh, the time of the Greek astronomers, we always observed the sky and we were detecting the light that was emitted from a celestial objects such as stars, such as galaxies, uh, clusters of galaxies. But so light was a very important messenger between us and the unknown universe outside of our planet. So if dark matter particles do not emit light, you may wonder, but how do we know that they exist if we cannot look at them, we cannot see them? Okay, so this is the first question I would like to address in this lecture. And uh, the answer is, uh, it can be summarized in uh, these uh, simple sentences. Of course, what we are going to observe in the sky are visible objects. We cannot, we still use telescopes, we still detect electromagnetic radiations, or maybe in the last centuries we had also cosmic rays, now we have gravitational waves, so we have all sorts of messages. But what we do is we observe in the sky the motion of visible objects, and we observe this motion very, very carefully. It's important to perform careful observations. And then using the known laws of gravity, we can reconstruct the gravitational potential because the motion of these visible objects is driven by gravitational forces. And so by using the Newton's law of gravity, we study the trajectory of these visible objects and then we know what the potential responsible for that motion is. Once we know the potential, then it's a, a simple application of the Poisson equation that I put in this box. Uh, to find the mass density that gave rise to that potential. And this procedure allows us to infer the total amount of matter, both visible and invisible. So by visible and invisible, I mean emitting electromagnetic waves and not, because this is just a gravitational effect, okay? so. In order for these particles to contribute to the scalar potential phi, they don't need to be visible. They just need to carry mass and, in other words, carry gravitational interactions. So this is the way that we can infer the presence of matter, whether visible or not. And then, uh, of course, uh, at the end of this procedure, we have to compare the output of this calculation with the amount of matter that we see with our eyes or with our telescopes, it would be more appropriate to say. And if there is a deficit, in other words, if we find that the total amount of matter is larger than the one that we see with our eyes, then we can argue that there is a matter deficit and there must be something invisible. So this is the general idea. And this is how over the years we got convinced that there must be dark matter. So historically, when you, even when you go at dark matter talks, uh, not, not too often nowadays, but I remember I've seen this picture many times. And in general, when uh, you discuss dark matter, the first uh, scientist that you mentioned is uh, a Swiss astronomer called Fritz Zwicky, that he was the first one, the first one to uh, point out that there was some mass deficit in the coma cluster. So the coma cluster is uh, a cluster of galaxies, which is uh, a gravitational bound system of galaxies. Each galaxy, each galaxy is more or less like the Milky Way, the galaxy where we live. And uh, what 
Zwicky did was a careful observation of the motion of the galaxies within the coma cluster. And uh, thanks to this motion observation, he was able to provide two independent measurement of the total mass of the cluster. So imagine a spherical distribution of, uh, of galaxies. And uh, this is like uh, uh, 10 to the five galaxies, more or less. This is the typical size of a cluster. And once he compare these two measurements of the mass, he found a surprise. So let's look at the coma cluster uh, in more detail. So this is a picture of the coma cluster. So each point uh, in this uh, figure, it's a galaxy. And uh, a galaxy like uh, our galaxy. As I say, the cluster is a gravitationally bound system of many, many galaxies. And uh, Zwicky measured, he tried to measure the mass of uh, this cluster by following two methods. The first one was just by uh, measuring the so-called luminous mass. So he was looking at luminous objects. He detected actually the luminosity from this object and he converted this luminosity into a mass by using a non-luminosity to mass ratio. Okay, so this was a measurement that provided Zwicky with an estimate of the mass of the cluster that was emitting light. The second method was uh, uh, along the lines of the idea I was describing before. So he tried to infer the gravitational potential by studying the motion of visible objects. And then thanks to this uh, uh, reconstruction of the gravitational potential, he was able to uh, infer the total amount of mass of the cluster. So luminous and not luminous. So this is known as the gravitational mass. Okay, so it's, the, it's just the, the mass that is there, whether it emits light or not. So the exercise that he did is a beautiful example of uh, the virial theorem application in classical mechanics. So this is problem one of the first problem set that I prepared for you. And it should be posted on the website of the school. And in this exercise, I went through the derivation. I mean, I, I will have you go into the derivation of Zwicky by uh, deriving the video theorem and applying the video theorem to the, to the coma cluster and see how you measure this uh, mass uh, here. So I invite all of you to uh, do this exercise. And then if you have questions, we can discuss more in the Q&A during the week. So the result that Zwicky uh, pointed out was a mass deficit in the coma cluster. And in particular, the visible mass was much, much less than the total mass of the cluster. So, uh, Zwicky, incidentally, was also the first one that invented the name dark matter. Uh, he wrote the name in German because he was uh, from Switzerland, but uh, uh, the name uh, was translated into English into dark matter, which is the way we call it uh, still today, almost uh, 100 years after. And uh, I mean, my, my interpretation by reading papers and by reading reviews is that uh, in the 30s, nobody uh, took the idea of Zwicky seriously, because uh, it was uh, probably too radical to talk about something invisible. And also the observations were not, probably the astronomical observations were not as reliable as uh, they are now and uh, as they were in the, in the 70s, when for the first time uh, the dark matter evidence was taken seriously in a way that I will describe in a second. It's just fair to say that Actually, the Zwicky estimate, as I brought in the problem one, was off by a factor of 10. So the ratio between the gravitational mass and the coma that Zwicky pointed out was uh, 10 times larger than the actual value, but it's still a ratio much larger than one. So Z Zwicky was right that there was some anomalous motion of galaxies in the cluster. By anomalous, I mean that they were moving too fast with respect to the matter that was present. But the numbers were off by an order of magnitude because uh, it was uh, using a wrong value for the, for the Hubble constant. But uh, this is historically the first environment where dark matter was discovered. So um, Vera Rubin 
led the effort that in the 70s convinced everybody that actually dark matter, actually something invisible was present. And uh, this time the observation environment uh, were uh, galaxies and there were uh, spiral galaxies uh, such as the Milky Way. And uh, also in this case, there was a comparison between what was observed and the theoretical expectation based on the visible mass, on the mass that we could see. So what uh, Vera Rubin and collaborators uh, did was to measure how the stars were moving inside spiral galaxies. So here is a beautiful picture of a spiral galaxy very similar to the Milky Way. Of course, this picture cannot be the Milky Way because we cannot take nice pictures such as this one of the Milky Way since we live inside the Milky Way. But this is a spiral galaxy which is more or less uh, of the same size and with the same number of stars, similar properties. And uh, the goal of this uh, experimental effort, observational effort was to provide a plot like this one, where as a function of R, and R was the distance from the center of the galaxy, uh, they were trying to plot V of R, the velocity of stars orbiting around the center of the galaxy. Just to give you one example, we should know all very well, the sun is uh, more or less uh, eight kiloparsec away from the center of the Milky Way, and it spins around the center of the Milky Way with a velocity which is 220 kilometers per second. Okay, so the, the, the exercise was to produce a line for this plot. And of course, uh, not only they did the observations, but they also compare the uh, results with the theoretical prediction. So let me first discuss what the theoretical prediction was. The theoretical prediction was that around the center of the galaxy, so there is uh, some uh, critical radius that identifies two regimes. Uh, you expect the velocity to go linearly at uh, short distances, but then as you look at the outskirts of the galaxy, and uh, by outskirts, I mean at the radius much larger than this critical value in such a way that most of the mass is uh, inside the radius you are observing, then you need to observe something which is in agreement with the third law of Ke Kepler, okay? So this is a decrease on the velocity which goes like uh, the radius to the minus one half, and this is just consistent with the third law of uh, Kepler. And uh, the actual finding was a big surprise because uh, here I put uh, a result uh, for a specific spiral galaxy. Now we measure lots of galaxies and uh, this, these dots are the experimental points, okay? So these uh, dots here are the experimental points and uh, this line is a fit and this uh, fit is the combined uh, effect of a disk component and the disk is the visible disk, is the theoretical expectation I was telling you before. Then there is also a halo component that is provided by an additional amount of mass. And this uh, halo component is uh, making sure that the velocity of the stars within the galaxy is actually larger than the one you would expect just based on the visible mass. So the interpretation of this result was that this is a nice visualization of what actually uh, is going on for each spiral galaxy, in particular for the Milky Way, you have a, a disk, okay, where uh, this is something we can observe, this is something we can see, and then there is a spherical dark matter halo surround, surrounding the, the disk uh, with a spherical symmetry, and then uh, in order to uh, give you a velocity which is constant at large radii, you need a mass density which goes uh, as r to the minus two. So you can just uh, take the equation of motion, the very simple equation of motion for a circular orbit uh, of uh, a given star at distance r, and you know by the Gauss law that only the mass inside the radius r contributes to the motion, you write uh, the mass by, uh, again, uh, using the density and all the volume factor. And then you see that if the rho of the halo decreases with the radius as r to the minus two, then you get v of r constant. And uh, 
this is actually what we observe for numerical simulations. And uh, according to different simulation, you find different results. And uh, I just want to mention these results, uh, but uh, of course uh, they all have caveats. I just I want to emphasize that the, the profile of dark matter inside the Milky Way will be very important when we discuss indirect searches, which will be the third or the fourth lectures, depends on how I decide to divide the, the experimental searches. But uh, keep in mind that the halo distribution, the halo mass distribution, is something that we reproduce thanks to n-body simulations, okay? We have different results. But this is a very important input for the prediction of fluxes uh, for indirect searches. This is something we will see later, but please keep in mind these results. Okay, so the uh, Zwicky uh, evidence was something that was not taken seriously. The um, galaxy core by Vera Rubin was something that uh, uh, was the first time that people took the dark matter evidence seriously, but now we have evidence for dark matter, not only at scales of a galaxy, but we also have evidence for dark matter at the scales of uh, uh, clusters of galaxies and even on the scale of the entire observable universe. So in the last decades, we have been accumulating evidence for missing matter and these evidences all pointed to the fact that there is a mass deficit by the same amount. So it's remarkable because we've been testing different size of the universe and even if the different phases of the expansion history, and they all point to the same number, which is the 26.8% as a fraction of the critical density that I was mentioning before. So my goal now is to briefly uh, give you a flavor of all of different uh, evidence at different scales, but maybe this is a good point to uh, check if there is any question. And I asked Enrico if... Uh... Yes, Francesco. So we have a couple of questions. So let me read them for you. So Ankit, is asking, is the Virial theorem also used to infer the total mass? So the Virial theorem, the total mass of the cluster. I guess so, yes, he was so asking. The Virial, uh, the Virial the theorem, you, you will see in the exercise uh, precisely what I mean, but the Virial theorem is used only for the total mass. So the Virial theorem is a method that will allow you to estimate the total mass of the cluster and to estimate the visible mass, uh, you have to detect the luminosity that is reaching the Earth from the visible objects on the cluster. So the viral theorem is only for the total mass of the cluster. Very good. So we have a, another question from Lorenzo. So he's asking, is it possible that measuring uh, the luminosity we lose uh, a lot of galaxies that we do not see because they have too low light? That's, if that's this is the case, way. could this account for at least a part of the missing matter? Okay, so uh, this is an excellent question and uh, uh, it is definitely possible. Uh, as far as I'm concerned now, uh, we know that actually of these 5% uh, of uh, baryons, as they are conventionally called, this 5% of uh, standard model matter, only 1% is luminous. Okay, so now we, as I mentioned, we have a, a better way of estimating dark matter density. And when we provide numbers for the density, we do not use uh, uh, this data here. So I, I think uh, it is uh, definitely possible that there is uh, something that is uh, made of standard model matter, but it's not emitting enough light that we detect that. But uh, as I will show in the next evidences, uh, we, we have a way to disentangle standard model matter from non-standard model matter. And uh, this is in few slides, but that's an excellent question. Okay, for the moment, that's it, Francesco. Very good. So I will continue just uh, uh, mentioning because uh, given the amount of time I have, uh, I mean, each one of these methods could uh, be easily a sect of five lectures. So I just want to give you what uh, some ideas about uh, what uh, these methods are and then uh, you're more than welcome to ask me more questions uh, even in we have several q a sessions so uh, you can ask and uh, i will try to answer 
also I'm a theory, so uh, on this observational matter, uh, there must be also something I don't know. Okay, so I need to move on. Okay, so the first uh, other method I want to mention is uh, the one of gravitational lensing. The reason why this is important, so gravitational lensing, first of all, is an effect predicted by gravitational, by general relativity, and uh, it's uh, about the bending of light moving uh, next to a high concentration of mass, okay? Uh, this is a, a nice way because uh, in the example I just discussed, the one of uh, Vera Rubin and, um, and the spiral galaxies, we could have data point only as long as there are visible objects in the disk, okay? But the halo of dark matter particles in the galaxy extends way beyond the visible disk. So actually, let me go back to this figure. You see that we imagine this is a, a spiral galaxy that we observe. We could observe visible objects only up to this point, but the halo extends also here. So it would be nice to get access to this uh, outside region of the halo where there is no visible object anymore, but uh, this is not possible to probe with the technique of uh, Vera Rubin, okay? That was introduced by Vera Rubin. So the lensing is a way that allows us to uh, overcome this limitation because we observe light from some distant object and all we require is that distant object has to pass through dark matter halo but we don't need the dark matter halo to have something visible. So this is a nice way to map the dark sky. The other interesting thing, this is interesting because historically it was the first uh, environment uh, where uh, dark matter was uh, observed, the environment of uh, galaxy clusters, uh, such as the one uh, of uh, Coma, where Zwicky made the first observations. So these clusters, they have uh, a hot gas between galaxies that I believe it arises from as a residual of the cluster formation. And uh, it doesn't fall gravitationally inside a galaxy, but it moves in the space uh, between galaxies. And this uh, uh, gas uh, uh, we can, can be probed by observing its X-ray emission. And uh, by imposing hydrostatic equilibrium for this gas, so hydrostatic equilibrium means that the gradient of the pressure is equal to the gravitational force. So it's, it's a balance between two effects, the gravitational force and the uh, the radiation pressure force and the radiation pressure is something we can map because we map the x-ray emission okay so just by studying the hydrostatic equilibrium of the hot gas inside the, the cluster then we can infer the distribution of again this is our goal the total mass of the cluster which has an effect on the hydrostatic equilibrium whether it is visible or not so this is the complementary way to measure the Gravitational mass, uh, by gravitational mass, uh, I mean uh, the mass that is there, period, whether it emits light or not. I'm accounting for that because it's contributing to gravitational force. So this is also a way that we have to measure the uh, total amount of mass of the cluster, and then we can do again a comparison like Zwicky did and point that there is a, a problem. So coming back to the previous question, this is a measurement of the visible mass that does not rely upon observing every galaxy, but it's just uh, the X-ray uh, distribution. So this uh, overcomes the limitation that could have had Zwicky in the 30s, uh, the way we do it today. Okay, so this is probably uh, the best, uh, uh, one of the best uh, evidence. Uh, so I have two more examples. The first one is uh, the cosmic uh, microwave background. So the cosmic microwave background is something that uh, I'm sure you have discussed in the first week uh, during the lectures on cosmology. So the CMB forms when the universe was uh, not so young anymore, even though much younger than now, it was 380,000 years. The temperature was one third of the electron volt and we observe tiny density fluctuations. So this is a map of the sky in the CMB temperature fluctuations. 
And when CMB forms, uh, uh, at this time, the universe was uh, a quite boring place, I would say, compared to the early universe where we had the uh, uh, hot plasma of many elementary particles. But at such a low temperature, we only had photons, neutrinos, electrons, protons, and dark matter around. Okay. Of course, uh, there is also uh, dark energy, but uh, since the dark energy, the energy density of dark energy stay constant with time, back as such at uh, higher temperature, in particular much higher than today, the energy density of the cosmological constant was a subdominant component, so we can neglect that. And uh, neutrinos are there just uh, uh, as relativistic species, and uh, they basically have an impact on the, acceler um, on the expansion rate of the universe. You know, there is a correspondence between the Hubble rate and um, the energy content of the universe. Matter radiation equality is also around the scale, but let's say as we approach the time of CMB formation, neutrinos have been decoupled for many, many decades in the temperature. They decoupled when the temperature was one MeV. So they contribute to the expansion rate through their energy density. But photons, electrons, and protons, they uh, are part of a tightly bound plasma uh, thanks to Coulomb and the Thomson scattering. And uh, on one hand, uh, we would have uh, this tiny density fluctuation that would want uh, uh, under dense region to fall into over dense region just because of the effect of gravity. And so this seems a runaway process where matter keeps falling into this uh, uh, deeper region where the gravitational potential as, uh, as it arises from a larger density of mass, okay? But there is a competing effect, and this competing effect is the effect of the radiation pressure. And as long as the universe is ionized, the radiation pressure will prevent uh, this collapse, and the result is described by the physics of basically sound waves, okay? At the same time, there is the dark matter, which uh, I call, uh, I assume it's made of a single elementary particle, which I call chi, which will be a name that I will use a lot during this lecture. My dark matter candidate will very often be called chi, so let's get used to that. And there is no radiation pressure for uh, the dark matter because it's totally decoupled from this, except for gravity, as we know, there is always gravity connecting the visible universe to dark matter, but Chi particles are free to collapse under their own gravity. And by studying the uh, spectrum of uh, CMB temperature fluctuations, we can measure individually the total amount of matter and the amount of baryonic matter. By baryonic matter, I mean the amount of matter present in this uh, uh, tightly bound plasma and the mass density is uh, entirely accounted for protons because the proton mass is much larger than the electron mass, okay? So we have a way to measure at the time of CMB formation. So uh, at the time when the universe was much younger than today, and we have uh, evidence that already at that time, there was a dark matter component that was five times denser than the baryonic component. So also to answer to the previous question, we uh, know that not all the baryonic matter is luminous enough that we can observe that, but these results convinces us that uh, at least 85% uh, um, of matter, actually, actually uh, exactly 85% of matter, which is the result of this factor of five, is made of dark matter, okay? So five over six dark matter, one over six baryons. And in particular, we have evidence that dark matter must be non-baryonic. Uh, it's also worth mentioning another uh, remarkable uh, result, which is the one of Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which is something you also saw last week, I believe. And uh, the Big Bang nucleosynthesis is a way that we have to measure the baryon density, the amount of baryons in the universe. It's consistent with the number we get from CMB, and so again, it's a number which is much smaller by, by factor of five than the total amount of matter in the universe. So once we compare all of these results, it's clear that uh, we need a non-baryonic component, which is five times denser than the baryonic component. The last example I would like to discuss, which is uh, 
one of my favorites, if uh, not the favorite, is uh, the evidence for dark matter based on structural formation. There is this nice picture of the, which I took from the particle data group. And uh, this is the usual uh, expansion history of the universe from the Big Bang until today. And you know, until uh, the time of, uh, I mean, at least and at the time of BBN, the universe was very homogeneous and isotropic. Even at the time of CMB formation, it was homogeneous and isotropic. And we know that because we detect uh, tiny density fluctuations in the CMB at the level of 10 to the minus five. Okay, so of course, uh, the current universe looks very different. If you think about our galaxy and you compare the relative density fluctuation between our galaxy and the average universe, you get a factor of 10 to the five. Okay, so we live in a galaxy which is a huge over density, okay, with respect to the, to the, to the total universe. So it's interesting to, ha to ask ourselves how did we go from this uh, very homogeneous anisotropic universe to galaxies and clusters? And uh, our standard understanding is that these uh, primordial density fluctuations, the one we measure in the CMB, collapse under their own gravity and uh, they collapse until they reach a nonlinear regime and they gave rise to the structures such as galaxies and clusters we observe today. So, you can study the evolution of relative density fluctuation as a function of the scale factor A. So A here is the scale factor. And you can compare the result for radiation domination and matter domination. These are well-known results. And in particular, you can try to ask yourself uh, what the universe would look like today if we only had baryons. And if we only had baryons, uh, uh, you know, the, the growth is described by the scale factor and uh, perturbation in the baryons, because of the effect of this radiation pressure, they cannot grow before the time of CMB. So we know the CMB value of this delta rho over rho is 10 to the minus five. And we also know that the most they can grow is a, it's a, it's, it's a value which is the ratio of the scale factors between now and the recombination. So this factor is 1000. So if the universe was only made of baryonic matter and not something non-baryonic, the value of the density fluctuation today would be 10 to the minus two, okay? So 10 to the minus two, of course, is still much less than one, and we are far away from a nonlinear regime, and it would not be possible to uh, form galaxies and clusters. So you can uh, reach the nonlinear regime, and uh, you can uh, form the cosmological structure we see today, and after all, this is the reason why, why we are here. If the universe was still homogeneous and isotropic, we will not be here uh, listening. You will not be here listening to these lectures. I will not be here giving this lecture. So we are here because there is dark matter. Okay, so I started my uh, lecture with uh, a big question that I wanted to answer, which was about the composition of the universe. Let's say that 2,000 years after Democritus, we finally came to an understanding of the visible universe in the sense that at least we know the building blocks and the interactions among them. I don't want to say there are no problems there. Of course, the standard model has a lot of open questions that are very interesting. But the question I want to focus on now, which is the question driving most of my research, is to try to understand what uh, these uh, dark building blocks could be. And of course, learning the lesson from Galileo, not only coming up with ideas, but also coming up with options to test these ideas experimentally. Okay, cool. so- We have a couple of questions. Yes, this is a good time to stop actually. Yes, please. Okay. So let me, so the first question is from Nehal, who is asking, do gravitational waves also undergo gravitational lensing? And if yes, can we expect the gravitational wave observatories to measure similar evidences of dark matter in the near future? Okay, so uh, let me think, uh, let me think. So the idea is uh, if uh, gravitational waves could in some sense provide a map of uh, dark matter yes. in the sky. Yes, uh, I think that's the idea. Mm, so I'm not aware of any of these, but maybe this is a question we could ask. We have two experts on gravitational waves in the next few lectures. So 
maybe this is something that we can defer to to the Q&A when there are also the other people but I'm not aware of any of these uh, of these uh, of these options here so Nehal please keep this question for the Q&A yeah, session yeah yeah so I, I encourage I encourage the student to ask questions to other lectures because I may just not know so we have another question from Ganesh uh, who who's asking are all galaxies rotating in the same directions or do they all have their own rotational directions? Uh, so direction you mean clockwise or counterclockwise? I think so. I think he refers yeah. to the direction of the, of the angular momentum. Yeah, so the rotation happens in the galactic plane. So the angular momentum is orthogonal to the galactic plane. Now, if it's pointing upward or downward, I don't think uh, it makes any difference. Also because it depends on if, if you look at the galaxy this way or the other way, no? So uh, the rotation plane is on the disk and the angular momentum is orthogonal to the disk. But then uh, if it's clockwise or counterclockwise, it depends on the way you, the galaxy is oriented with respect to us. So both options are possible. So we have a third question from Manush, who's, uh, who's asking, can you please explain how CMB fluctuations depend upon gravitational interactions with the dark matter? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Because I didn't hear uh, the last one. Yeah, can you please explain how CMB fluctuations depend upon the, the gravitational interactions with dark matter? Okay, so this is uh, something uh, uh, which would require a long... Uh, uh, answer because it's uh, the complicated physics of the of the of the plasma evolving and interacting gravitational with the with the with the with, with the dark matter uh, the short answer is that you see a different behavior in the peaks of the plot that here okay and these uh, peaks are the results of these uh, sound waves and these sound waves are affected by the amount of matter which is around but uh, Maybe this is something that we can devote a, a longer discussion in, in the Q and A because it's uh, it will it will take a while to 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 give all the ingredients. Okay. Okay, Francesco. So one last question from Oppo. So he's asking: If not baryonic, then what are the possibilities? So the possibilities uh, there are countless possibilities, and I will discuss uh, some of them during the uh, the. the this set of lectures, of course, uh, there is no uh, limit on the creativity of theorists. And uh, you will see, I mean, I think the best way to answer is uh, just wait. And uh, this week will be devoted to explicit examples. And I will give you a way to show how they uh, were formed and produced in the early universe, how we search for them today. Uh, so I, I will give you lots of, ex well, some examples, and I will focus on the, on examples motivated from uh, the, the top down. So motivated candidates that we expect they have good motivation to exist, but of course my list will not be exhausted. And there are new ideas coming up very regularly on uh, scientific papers. But okay. uh, For Yes, there will be new particles, new particles beyond the standard model interacting weekly with us. So that's it for the moment, Francesco. Very good. So I actually have a question for you. Yes. Uh, since I started late, uh, is it okay if I talk until uh, 15.45, my time? Can, so you do, can you do 15.40? Because at 15.45, the new lecture would start. So we get Okay, okay. yeah, so this is useful for me to... to, to to just uh, set uh, my pace, okay? Yes, uh, the, I will let you know when you're 10 minutes away, when thank it's 2.30. Uh, thanks for the question, guys. This is uh, great. I, I, I'm happy we can at least interact uh, remotely. So in the last uh, 35 minutes, I will uh, try to uh, address, uh, well, not only the last 35 minutes, this is actually the goal of uh, this uh, set of lectures, because based on the observational evidence that we have, uh, uh, we have a standard model here, which we know the content and we know the rules, the, the, the laws governing the interactions. 
And then there is dark matter. This is a huge black box in the sense that we have no idea about what kind of particles can fit this, uh, this uh, square here. And uh, the way we know that this dark matter exists is because there is a communication between these two sectors, which is due to gravity, okay? And uh, it's fair to say that as long as we, uh, as far as we know, this would be enough to explain the data. We have no additional evidence that there is some other interaction beyond the one due to gravity. And this would be a very uh, bad news because it will be difficult to detect these particles. But every time you, write, you try to write a sensible model uh, for dark matter, you, un you end up uh, having other interactions and whatever ends up being here is uh, very important because it will be the, the telling us the way uh, how we are going to search for these particles and how we are going to eventually discover them, as I will discuss in uh, the lectures I, I give this week. Okay, so if you want uh, uh, the the goal of uh, these uh, these lectures, but in general the goal of this research program is. Uh, not only to try to understand what to put in this box here, but also to come up with a new version of this t-shirt where there is not only the standard model, but there is also dark matter. And this will be, uh, telling, it will be telling us the uh, interactions beyond the gravitational ones between the standard model and the, the dark sector, okay? So coming back to the previous question, if not baryonic, what? I will tell you uh, possible ideas about uh, what it could be. And in particular, I will tell you what to put here and what to write in the t-shirt, okay? For the interactions uh, between uh, the standard model and the dark matter. And whatever I put on that t-shirt will be eventually telling us the best strategy to test uh, that experimentally, okay? So I will start giving you explicit ideas from tomorrow. Today, I want to be uh, a bit uh, more careful telling you that we cannot put anything we want. Because we, <clears throat> I, I say that we have no idea what may end up being the, in this box and also on this t-shirt, which is, which is, uh, which is uh, honest, it's fine. And uh, it's also, in my opinion, what makes this research field very exciting because uh, there is an entire chapter to be written in the book of uh, fundamental interactions. But it's true that we have been searching for dark matter for several years, for several decades, without finding it. But these searches were very useful because thanks to them, we could learn what dark matter cannot be. So my goal for the next, uh, uh, for the remaining part of this lecture, and uh, I will, uh, I'm sure I will be able to finish in, uh, in less than 30 minutes, so there is no problem with the next lecture and then the, with the coffee break. I want to tell you uh, a list of uh, things that we need to make sure they are respected whenever we build uh, a dark matter um, model. This is not a complete set of requirements, but whatever I'm going to tell you about today will be true for any model, okay, will be general. Then within specific models, you may have additional uh, requirement, but what I'm telling you now is something that you have to make sure that is satisfied. Otherwise, your model will not be consistent with the data. So the first requirement I want to talk about is the requirement of relic density. I already gave you a number at the beginning of this lecture is this uh, famous 26.8%, the fraction of the total energy that is accounted for by dark matter particles. There is a more uh, common way to express this number, which is uh, through the omega parameter. And the, the omega parameter is the ratio between the density of dark matter and the critical density today. And uh, this uh, little h square is the Hubble constant expressed in the units that you should have seen in the previous week uh, when you discussed cosmology. And using these variables, omega h square, 
the amount of dark matter is uh, more or less 0 0.12, okay, by using these units. And these are the units that are used uh, in most of the research papers about uh, dark matter that you, you read. Uh, and so it's very important to get familiar with this, uh, with this uh, unit to quantify dark matter density. I would like to mention another way of quantifying the dark matter density, which is something that I actually prefer because whenever you write down a model, it's, it allows you to make a clear connection with what you're doing. So there is this variable that I define to be C and it's the density of dark matter divided by the entropy density today, okay? So if you uh, have seen what the entropy density is and you have seen the conservation of entropy as the entropy density times the scale factor cube, you recognize this ratio as the commoving mass density for dark matter, okay? So this is something that is uh, constant after dark matter is produced, but this is something we will see in more detail tomorrow. But, uh, you know, if the dark matter ma uh, the mass density, if you write that as mass times uh, number density, because dark matter particles uh, are uh, non-relativistic, so the mass density comes from the rest mass. And uh, you identify the ratio between N and S as the commoving number density. You find that the product between the dark matter mass and the commoving number density is more or less 4.35 times 10 to the minus 10 GeV. So as an exercise that I did not put in the problem set because I only put two, but uh, something that I encourage you to do, and it's a very useful exercise, is to start from this number here and uh, from this number here, derive this number here, okay? This is very useful because as we will see tomorrow, when you do relic density calculations, usually the output of your calculation is this number here, is the Y, the N. So it's uh, much simpler to check whether your model makes sense or not, just by taking the output of your calculation and multiplying it by M. And then you have to reproduce this, uh, this, uh, this number here. So now what I'm going to do is to, in this box, I will keep uh, discussing requirements and then whenever I'm done I will put the requirement I asked for here so we will end up with a list so we keep track of what we are discussing. The second thing is uh, bounce on the mass and again within the given framework as we will discuss for WIMPs uh, in, uh, in uh, the second or third lectures it, it depends but within a given framework you can put bounds on the dark matter mass but there are bounds based on observational evidence that are actually bounds that you have to satisfy all the time. So the first bound uh, uh, is for boson dark matter and uh, it's a very simple bound that tells you that the De Broglie wavelength has to be smaller than the typical size of dwarf galaxies. Dwarf galaxies are uh, satellite galaxies of the Milky Way that uh, we observe uh, not too far away from us. And uh, this requirement uh, is equivalent to say that we can package dark matter particle inside objects that are smaller than the smallest we could observe, okay? So you can compute the De Broglie wavelength as a function of the mass, uh, and uh, you find this relation here. So the bigger the mass, the smaller the length. So this is an issue that arises if the dark matter particle is, of course, very light. And the bound you get from imposing this bound is that dark matter mass must be uh, higher than 10 to the minus 22 electron volt. Okay, so this is a very small uh, number, but nevertheless, you need that the dark matter mass must be heavy enough, heavier than this small number here. So the bounds are much more serious for fermion dark matter because uh, of uh, the Pauli exclusion principle. So the bond you get, I give you the result here because it arises from a very nice calculation where you need the simple ingredients from undergraduate physics. You need some statistical mechanics and not much more. 
So I put uh, a problem two in the problem set where you can derive this bound yourself and uh, I guide you through the derivation. So the, the exercise will also suggest the intermediate steps. So for now, I just quote the result and you see that uh, the um, mass of dark matter has to be heavier than 10 or 100 dV, it depends on the environment you observe, but uh, it's uh, a more severe bound with respect to the one that you get for bosons because of the poly expression principle. This trim trimane gun bound will be also important when we discuss uh, the option of neutrino as dark matter. So I've been arguing that neutrino requires, sorry, that dark matter requires physics to understand a model, but Historically, neutrino was a possible option for dark matter. Now we know it's not a possibility anymore, and uh, this uh, is one of the reasons. But there are other reasons that we will discuss tomorrow. Okay, so dark matter, of course, has to be neutral. Otherwise, we would see the light that uh, these dark matter particles emit. And uh, there are bounds uh, which uh, are uh, on, uh, on, uh, on the... Uh, much smaller than the than the electric charge of the electrons. So uh, there are searches for dark matter electron bound states, uh, bound states by electromagnetic interactions. So the bound, of course, depends on the dark matter mass because if the dark matter mass is heavier, you have uh, a smaller number density because the mass density is what we measure. And uh, the bound uh, uh, here, I apologize, it should be less or equal than to the minus, I will fix this typo in the slide, I'm, I'm sorry. 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 4, okay? So the, the, the dark matter has to be neutral, and if it carries any electric charge, this must be orders of magnitude be, below the electron mass. Now, this is a quite important constraint, and uh, I will mention the result, and again, uh, when we discuss neutrino uh, possibility, we will see that this requirement excludes neutrino, and I will give you an exercise to derive this bound uh, in the problem set of the second lectures. But I want to mention that uh, dark matter particles uh, must be cold. There is a requirement on the coldness of these uh, uh, new degrees of freedom. And this uh, criterion uh, is equivalent to the statement that dark matter particles must have been non relativistic when the universe had a temperature of more or less one kV, so way below BBN, okay? BBN happens at one MeV. Dark matter particles must have been relativistic when the universal temperature around kV. This excludes hot relics, this excludes neutrinos in particular, and this will be something that we discuss tomorrow in more details, and in particular, I will give you one exercise that will uh, guide you through the derivation of this requirement, this number here. Okay, so uh, I'm uh, close to the end, so we are perfectly in time. Another bound is the on the self-interaction of dark matter. So this is a beautiful picture of the bullet cluster. Um, this is a famous uh, uh, picture that got a lot of attention in the media, and it was uh, taken, I believe, uh, 15 years ago, more or less. And uh, this is a picture of the collision between two galaxy clusters. And this is a picture of what happened after the collisions. So the blue region is uh, the gravitational mass of the two clusters that was uh, uh, measured by the gravitational lensing. And uh, the hot region, this red region, is uh, the gas that was measured through the X-ray emission. So you see that as a consequence of the collision, the gas that has a lot of self-interactions got stuck around the collision point. And most of the mass, which is dominated by dark matter, just pass through each other without any problem, okay? So this is a very visual evidence also convincing you that dark matter must exist and it must be non-baryonic because this is a picture that tells you clearly that the visible mass <clears throat> is uh, displaced from the from the most of the gravitational mass okay but you can also besides using this uh, figure to uh, convince yourself that uh, dark matter must be there you can also use this uh, event and uh, other 
uh, events like this where you can um, you can impose bounds on dark matter self interactions because uh, from this picture it's clear that dark matter cannot interact too much with itself otherwise it would get stuck also around the collision point as the gas did okay so this is the bound you find and the bound is uh, sigma the cross section for dark matter self interactions divided by the mass of the dark matter so you constrain this combination and you want this to be less than one centimeter square over gram this is the way that usually this bound is given using these units which uh, from the point of view of particle physics are not very illuminating so i converted this uh, bound for you and i encourage you to do the same and uh, you just basically have to um, convert gram into TV, but uh, you know that the speed of light is one so in the natural units, so you, you can do that. And uh, you measure mass in the TV by using the fact that the speed of light is one. This is the natural unit system. And you see that for mass of one TV, the cross section has to be less than this number here. So you see from this explicit value that this is actually not a very strong bound because this cross section here is the typical size of cross section mediated by strong interaction. So we are saying that if the dark matter mass has, is around one TeV, the cross section for self interaction has to be smaller than the typical size of cross section of strong interactions, which are quite strong. So when you construct a model, it's usually not difficult to satisfy these bounds. Although there are models where uh, this bound is uh, saturated and actually you can see effects from self-interactions. Okay, the last thing I want to discuss before I get to the end. So I suggest I have two or three more slides, so I will go on until the end and then I will take questions at the end. Another important requirement uh, for dark matter is uh, the stability, okay? So we have seen that the dark matter must have been around at the time of CMB formation. And we have seen that the dark matter is around today in our galaxy, in all the spiral galaxies, in the cluster. So it looks a quite stable particle. And of course, most of the models that you can construct have a dark matter particle that is absolutely stable. The way, for example, the electron is stable, okay? so. Stable, not only over the age of the universe, but uh, stable in general. Strictly speaking, this is not necessary. Of course, if you have a dark matter particle which is absolutely stable, you have nothing to be worried about. But if you want to ask yourself, uh, well, if we can decay, what can I say about the lifetime? So here I put as a reference uh, the age of the universe expressed in seconds. So for sure, you want the dark matter lifetime to be longer than the age of the universe. Now, there are two bounds you can impose. First of all, you can say, OK, the dark matter is uh, unstable, and it decays to invisible objects. By invisible here, I mean with no electromagnetic interactions. Then the bounds is not so, I mean, it's, uh, it's a factor of uh, more than 10 larger than the age of the universe, but uh, it's uh, more or less comparable with the age of the universe. And the reason why you get this bound is that the dark matter particles decays to something invisible, but uh, uh, with a mass much less than the dark matter particle itself, you are converting during the expansion history non-relativistic energy into relativistic energy, and so you are affecting the expansion history, and this is something you have to see once you observe the universe on a large scale. That's the origin of this bound. Uh, however, the bound is much, much stronger when uh, you have uh, visible decays. By visible, again, I mean with decay to particle interacting through electromagnetic interactions. And the reason why you get this bound is that even though the lifetime is longer than the age of the universe, dark matter particle starts to decay before the time tau. You have this exponential profile, OK? the famous profile for uh, the, the decay is described by an exponential function. So uh, these uh, visible decays, they can impact the spectrum of CMB. 
For example, I can give you one, one simple case. Imagine the dark matter is a new scalar particle decaying to electron and positron, E plus, E minus. So you are injecting from dark matter decays new E plus, E minus in the plasma, and this will affect the way that we see the CMB today. So this leads to a much more stringent limits. Uh, and here I put the range because the precise number depends on the decay final state. Okay, so if it's electron is a number, if it's uh, pi ions is another number and so on. And so you see that when the decay products are visible, you have to be careful because you have bounds. But it's interesting to say that you will, when the decay product are visible, you also have a signal in the sky because uh, you could uh, observe environments such as the center of our galaxy and hope to detect some of these dark matter decay products. This is something we will discuss when we do indirect searches, okay? Okay, so I got to the end of my lecture, which is great because we also have a few minutes for questions. I expect there will be some other questions. So let me just say that uh, to summarize what we have seen today, we know that dark matter exists and uh, we had a brief review of how we got convinced about dark matter existence and how we managed to observe something invisible. It's not correct to say observe, but to, to infer the presence of something invisible. And here in the second part of the lectures, uh, I provided you with some requirement that every single dark matter particle must satisfy in order to be a viable candidate. And then coming back to this picture, which is a nice way to summarize what the problem is about, we will try in the next four lectures to put something in this box, to write something on this t-shirt and to see how dark matter uh, works, both in the early universe to get produced with the right abundance and today to be tested by experiments. So, Enrico, I will stop here and I will be very happy to take other questions. Perfect, Francesco. Thank you very much. A very nice lecture. Uh, so, we actually have quite a lot, uh, quite a few questions. So, Thanks. maybe we start uh, then uh, if, we, if we don't have time to answer all of them, we can go back to them uh, tomorrow during the Q&A session. Yeah, I mean, we have a week. There will be plenty yes. of time. Also, just to let you know, we have a Slack channel and uh, students are asking questions also there. So if you can uh, have a look from time to time. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. I saw the Slack channel on the, on the website of the school. So Great. So let me start with the first question from Samantha. So Samantha is asking, uh, what do you mean by co-moving density? Okay. So co-moving density is uh, a, a concept that uh, uh, is uh, useful because the universe is expanding. So this is something that I, I can explain more tomorrow in the lectures on uh, thermal production. But just to give an answer now, um, imagine that the density of particles in the universe, of a given particle, not dark matter particle, this moving density concept is something that is useful in general. Imagine that you have a given particle species and you say that the number density is uh, one particle for each cubic meter, okay? Now, we know that the universe is expanding. So even if these particles are completely decoupled from the rest of the particles, so there is no interaction changing the particle number, the number density will decrease with time because the universe is getting bigger. And so the number density, which is the number of particles divided the volume, is getting smaller because the volume is getting bigger, even if the total number of particles is constant. So the commuting number density is a new variable that I will define tomorrow. Okay, so that's good that this question was asked. So I will put particular attention when I prepare uh, the slides. Uh, it's a variable that takes away this effect of the expansion and uh, it's uh, changing, the, uh, the, the, the moving number density is changing only if there are particle changing process. So only if there are processes among particles that destroy or create this particle. But the effect of the expansion is taken away. And so commoving because uh, the commoving volume is something that does not change the universe expand. And uh, I will say more about that tomorrow, but this is just to give the idea. Okay, great. 
So let me move on. We have another question from Dibiendu, who's asking, why dwarf galaxies? Will the bound change if we use normal galaxies? So the, the, the reason why we choose uh, to put that bound on dwarf galaxies is because this is a bound on the De Broglie wavelength. And the requirement is that the De Broglie wavelength is uh, smaller than the object we see. So if we want to put the best bound on the mass, we have to look at the smallest objects where we know that dark matter is present. So dwarf galaxies are the smallest bound, gravitational bound systems which are uh, dominated by dark matter. So you can apply the same bound on our galaxy, but you will find the weaker bound. So that's why I didn't mention that. Okay, so Dipta has a question. Where does the bound from the, on the charge of dark matter comes from? So uh, the bound uh, on the charge of dark matter comes from uh, the uh, search for bound state between dark matter and electron. So this is the analog of a hydrogen atom where the dark matter is replaced by the proton. Sorry, where the proton is replaced by the dark matter. So if the dark matter has a tiny electron charge, tiny, there is still a chance that it could uh, bound into a hydrogen-like uh, atom where the dark matter plays the role of the proton and then the electron spins around. And since there was no observation of this uh, heavy, uh, these this, uh, this, uh, hydrogen-like atoms made of dark matter and electrons, you can translate this fact into the statement that the dark matter charge must be small enough to prevent this bound state formation. Okay, so we have uh, a question from Anupam, which I'm not sure I understand. I will read it uh, then, Francesco, you tell me if you understand, otherwise I do, Anupam can qualify better. As self-interacting dark matter, so QCD type interaction is required for dark matter? So the numerical value I gave uh, was that for a dark matter particle with mass 1 TeV, the cross-section for self-interaction must be smaller than the typical size of QCD cross-sections. So it doesn't mean that, dark, of course, the dark matter carries QCD charge. I just meant that the bound is not so strong because if you take TV, as we will see tomorrow, TV is quite a typical scale for dark matter candidates. The bound on self-interaction is that the cross-section must be smaller than the one mediated by QCD, which are quite large compared to weak interaction. So I only mentioned that number to say that it's not a very stringent bound, but you can build model where there is a self-interaction of that size, very close to the bound, but not because you charge dark matter under QCD. This is important. So I, I, I didn't want to mean that dark matter must carry color charge, okay? And just say that the experimental bound is around those values. And there are models where cross-sections so big can appear with interesting phenomenological consequences, but they have nothing to do with QCD. Okay. So, one more question from Ankit. Um, so, talking about self-interacting dark matter, can it lead to sizable signature on Earth or space-based experiments, specifically indirect and direct detection experiments? So, and if so, how? So, the answer is no, because self-interaction, I mean processes where you have dark matter, dark matter, going to dark matter, dark matter. Okay, so both the initial and the final state are invisible. And in order to have something such as direct or indirect detection, you need to find something visible, something you detect, okay? But they have interesting phenomenological consequences in the structure formation in particular, they could affect the mass distribution uh, of dark matter in the galactic halo close to the center. Okay, as a result of this self-interaction. So the density profile I gave you before from M-body simulations, they are obtained by implementing these M-body simulations without self-interactions, okay? If you put self-interactions, you can modify, uh, for example, the, 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 the radial profile and other things. But so the, the best way to test the self-interaction is through structure formation, the study of structure formation. 
Okay, very good. So, one more question from Lucas. Uh, so, Lucas is asking, does the cluster collision also bound the value of dark matter standard model interactions as a whole? Naively, I'd expect there is the resulting visible matter distribution to follow the lensing distribution to a degree depending on the strength of these interactions. I see, I see. So I, I would say that the interaction, I would say that whatever interaction there is between dark matter and, uh, and, and us is too small to have an impact on, uh, on, that, uh, on, that, uh, on that collision. So I'm not aware of any bound uh, that you can, you can put from this uh, type of uh, cluster collisions. And I think it's because uh, uh, it's too small the effect. So you can only test the self-interactions. Very good. So we arrive at the last question, Francesco. Very well done. Very good. It's perfectly in time. So, so the last question is, uh, any references? References? Uh, uh, yes, I can uh, give you some... Uh, you mean references for, uh, for, uh, for... For the material that you passed. The material. I can give you references to uh, lectures, very good lectures on, uh, on dark matter. I can collect them and maybe put on the Slack channel. I can create yes. the references. Or if yeah, you yeah. want to add them to, to the slides of tomorrow's lecture, feel free to do yes, as you prefer. Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 I can also do that. I can also do that. I mean, I, I, will, I will do a better job with the references in the next lectures when I discuss uh, specific realizations, specific implementations. Okay, very good. So there are no, no further questions. So I think this is a good time uh, to stop. So Francesco, thank you very much again for the very nice lecture. Uh, and see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Okay, so now we're going to have five minutes. Uh... Sorry? I, th I told the students, enjoy the rest of the